The bee has two types of mouth parts, the complex proboscis for sucking and the mandibles for biting. And in this video we're going to focus on the mandibles, the biting organ. The mandibles turn out to have more functions than we perhaps might at first have thought about. And there has been recent evidence which has extended our understanding of the mandibles even further. They have a defensive value in that the secretions of the mandibular gland can anaesthetize a small insect victim and we'll talk more about this. Let's look first of all at the structure of the mandibles. Small strong structures. To some extent you could say they look like an ice cream scoop. They have a thickish stubby top end where they joint to the head becoming coming down into a narrower neck then opening out into a scoop or spoon shape. The walls of the mandibles are thick cuticle and altogether they have a strong rigid structure. The two mandibles are hinged at either side of the mouth with joints at the front and at the back. The hinging is such that as the mandibles are brought together to close they also turn backwards a little bit. When they do meet together there's a sharp cutting edge that has a, has a keen biting action. Each of the two mandibles is operated by muscles which open and close. Abductor, the opening muscles, and adductor, a double D, adductor muscles, the closing muscles. And these are actually the second largest muscles in the bee after the indirect flight muscles. The largest of these, the one that causes the mandibles to bite together, the adductor muscle, is attached to the roof and the back of the head and then comes down in what is known as a unipennate arrangement to a tendon which attaches to the inner side of the base of the mandible. There are also some additional fibers which come from a separate tendon from a group of, of muscle fibers right on the roof of the head. The abductor is a little smaller than the abductor and this attaches on the outer side of the inside of the head behind the eyes and again comes down to a tendon which attaches on the side of the mandible. And these muscles between them are responsible for the mandible movement. The mandibles of the workers are the largest. Those of the queen are smaller and have a distinctive notch. The drone's mandibles are the smallest of all and they are particularly hairy. This example shows the mandibles of a drone after shaving. If we focus on the part of the mandible of a worker which meets the mandible on the other side, the sort of closing face, we notice that there is a groove running across the face of the mandible towards the tip and this groove is actually fringed by a line of hairs on either side. And if we look closely at this groove we'll see that it arises at the top from near the opening from the gland, the mandibular gland, and allows secretions from the mandibular gland to run down towards the tip of the mandibles. So let's look at the mandibular glands for a moment. These are glands in the cheeks or gena, G-E-N-A, of the, of the head of the bee and these are sac-like glands that means that the secretions are stored when not in use and are then available so that the bee can cause them to be secreted in significant quantities when it needs to. The largest mandibular glands are found in the queen still quite large ones in the worker but quite small mandibular glands in the drone. In the worker we know that the glands produce a chemical known as 2-heptanone and this is known to have an alarm type effect on other bees. However an additional function has recently been established in that if a bee bites a small arthropod such as a wax moth larva or a varroa and injects some of this 2-heptanone it causes a paralysis of the insect lasting for some minutes and so it appears to also have an important defensive action. The queen has the largest mandibular glands and the secretions of these glands include queen substance. 
this is of vital importance in the function of the hive and suppresses the production of queen cells by worker bees. The mandibular glands of the queen also produce substances which attract drones and other substances which stabilize swarms. These mandibular glands have a small duct from the base which leads just close to the inner joint at the base of the mandibles. Let's turn to the functions of the mandibles. An important function is to do with stabilizing the proboscis. The mandibles can grasp the proboscis and steady it when in use. And also when the proboscis is folded up out of use in the fossa behind the mandibles, the base of the proboscis is stabilized by the mandibles. The mandibles are important in manipulating materials. In wax, for example, the making of comb relies very heavily on the function of the mandibles. Also handling pollen, eating pollen. And as explained above, the mandibles have an important defensive role, both in dealing with wax moth larvae and other such small arthropods within the colony, but they are also used when the bee is on guard duty, when bees can be seen with the front legs raised off the surface and the mandibles open in their defensive posture. And there are many other roles for the mandibles in domestic duties around the hive. The function of the mandibles is controlled by muscles which move the mandibles, which are controlled by nerves from the brain, and also from sensory receptors. And he, this image shows small hair cells along the edges of the mandibles which provide information back to the brain on the position of the mandibles. So in, in summary the mandibles are thick and strong and operated by some of the most powerful muscles in the bee's body. They have a number of functions to do with food, to do with defense and to do with manipulation of substances and interestingly, recent evidence suggests that they have this specific role in attacking small arthropods and anesthetizing them so that they can then be removed from the hive. The images in this video have largely been drawn from the book Understanding Bee Anatomy. Further details are available on this website.